The Yad Vashem, or World Holocaust Remembrance Center, commemorates non-Jews who took great risks to save Jews during the Shoah with the title of Righteous Among the Nations. Today's protagonist is one of them. Cornelia ten Boom, known as Corrie, and her close family, they managed to save an estimated 800 lives during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. During the war, her profound religious faith and belief in God's plans gave her the bravery and resourcefulness to make it through situations that was worthy of a spy story. But it was after the war that she achieved her greatest accomplishment, forgiving her former enemies and teaching the world to do the same. Cornelia Arnada Johanna ten Boom was born in Harlem near Amsterdam on the 15th of April 1892 in a devoutly religious family. Her father, Casper, was a watchmaker who ran the business from their own home, the Bayer House. Corrie was the youngest of four siblings, her sister, Betsy and Nolly, and her brother, Willem. Her mother, also named Cornelia, and her father were members of the Dutch Baptist congregation and a point of moral reference for the community. Inspired by their faith, the Ten Bombs would offer shelter, food, and even money to those in need. They also maintained very good relationships with the local Jewish community, whom they considered God's ancient people. Corrie was always a busy girl, helping those in need both in and outside her family. From a very young age, she and Betsy organized Bible clubs for the local youth and offered tutoring to mentally disabled children. When her elderly aunts moved in, she still found the time to look after them. To make space for her aunts, Casper bought the house next to the bay. The levels of the two buildings did not match and there was an alleyway between them, but the two houses they had to be connected. This resulted in a very odd layout with winding staircases and empty spaces between walls. You're going to see in a moment why this is actually important. In her late teens, Corrie met and fell in love for the first time with a young man. She was expecting him to propose, but his mother did not approve of the union, deeming the Ten Bombs of lower social status. Her heart was broken, and she vowed to dedicate all of her love for Jesus. But as she pointed out, Jesus has taken care of me that I have never become a frustrated old spinster. In 1918, Mother Ten Bomb became bedridden from a cerebral hemorrhage. This added to Corrie's long list of commitments, but her energy had never failed her. She dedicated herself to doing all of the housework and even managing the family's business. She studied watchmaking, becoming the first licensed Dutch woman watchmaker. Unlike Casper, who wasn't very business-minded, Corrie had a keen commercial sense, and with her management of the shop, the family did better financially. Unfortunately, after three years of illness, Corrie's mother died in 1921. The elderly aunts also passed away shortly before. With an empty house and plenty of spare time, Corrie and her family they took the occasion to help people once again. First, they started welcoming the children left in the Netherlands by missionaries traveling to the Indonesian colonies. Then, over much of the 1930s, Corrie established a youth club for teenagers, where she taught religious studies, as well as performing arts and handicrafts. Unfortunately for her, and for the Netherlands, and for Europe, over the border in Germany, another type of youth club was gaining ground. Europe and the whole world were heading towards another war, but most people in the Netherlands, including the Prime Minister, believed that Germany would respect Dutch neutrality, as was the case in World War I. What they didn't know is that General von Manstein's plan to invade France relied on an initial attack through the Netherlands in order to divert Allied forces from the real main invading force entering Belgium via the Ardennes Forest. And so, after conquering Poland, Denmark, and Norway, the German military started to turn their attention towards the Western Allied powers. The phony war was about to give way to the actual one. On the 10th of May 1940, the Wehrmacht launched a combined attack on the Netherlands, supported by frequent bombing raids on the major Dutch cities. One night, Corrie was woken up by the noise of bombers flying over Harlem. She stood up and went into the kitchen, where Betsy, unable to sleep, offered her some tea. When Corrie returned to her room, she hurt her hand on something sharp. It was a piece of shrapnel from a bomb that had exploded nearby. The morning after, she pointed out to Betsy that if she had not drunk tea with her the night before, she could have been killed. The older sister remarked, There are no ifs with God. Being in the center of his will is our only safety. Despite a desperate resistance, German divisions quickly overran the country. On the 13th of May, the Dutch government and the royal family they were evacuated to Britain. On the 14th, the country capitulated. The Nazi occupation it was harsh from the very beginning, with the Gestapo starting to round up Jews and resistance fighters with the help of local collaborators, as well as confiscating all radios. The Ten Bombs managed to keep a clandestine wireless, listening to messages of hope coming from the BBC and from the Dutch Queen in exile in London. They also listened to some of Hitler's propaganda speeches. As Corrie remembered, 
It was the voice of a demon. Casper Ten Bomp was a pillar of the Harlem community, and so very soon his family was approached by resistance fighters and Jewish citizens asking for help. Casper, Corey, and Betsy, they faced a dilemma. Their faith compelled them to protect Jews, but being a part of the resistance implied taking a political stance which was against their beliefs. The doubts were wiped out by two events. First, Corey found out that her brother, Willem, and his son, Kirk, had already entered the clandestine resistance and were already offering shelter to Jews on the run. Even before the invasion, Willem had used a nursing home that he was managing as a haven for German Jews who had fled persecution. Then Casper heard about a local pastor who had refused to hide a Jewish orphan boy. He decided to welcome the boy into the house, the first of many lives, up to 800, that the Ten Bombs would save during the war. Corrie had a knack for organizing people around her. She soon put this talent to fruition when she recruited 80 of the members of the various youth and Bible groups to what became a very effective clandestine organization. Taking advantage of the uncommon layout of the bear and with the help of an architect in the resistance, Corrie had a secret room, a hiding place, built behind a fake wall in her own bedroom. The place could hide six people at a time. She also had a system of buzzers installed around the house. In case of danger, a family member would ring the buzzers, allowing the refugees to rush to the secret room where they would stand still and silent. When the coast was clear, the refugees would be sent to a vast network of safe houses around the country until they could flee abroad. On one occasion, the Ten Bombs heard that the Nazis had set their sights on a Jewish orphanage. Dozens of babies were facing certain death. Corey organized a daring raid. Among the people she helped were also German soldiers, deserters who did not want to carry out further atrocities. The Ten Bombs would give them civilian clothing and keep their uniforms. In this case, Corrie handed out the uniforms to members of her organization. Wearing this disguise, they simply entered the orphanage and took 100 babies. As the number of people they helped increased, the family had to solve the problem of feeding them. Food was rationed through a system of cards, of which the Ten Bombs held only three. By luck or divine providence, the local man in charge of the ration cards was one Fred Kunstra, whose mentally disabled daughter had been attending Corrie's church services for 20 years. Corrie was not sure if she could trust him, but she boldly asked for a hundred ration cards. To her surprise, Fred agreed immediately. But how could he justify a hundred missing cards to his Nazi supervisor? In a stroke of genius, Fred staged a realistic robber, even asking a friend to beat him up to make it look more plausible. The clandestine activities around Corrie's house increased with time, despite the threat of the Gestapo being ever-present and a police station being only a few blocks away. As Corrie feared that their phone was tapped, she devised a secret code. The sentence, I need a watch to be repaired, meant that another person needed hiding. The watchmaker shop was now a perfect front for people coming and going at all times. Casper also devised another code, a triangular advertising sign on the shop window that meant it was safe to come in. If it was placed back to front, it meant that it was better to wait. In February 1944, a man called Jan Vogel came asking for a different type of help. His wife, accused of being in the resistance, was in custody. A sympathetic policeman had promised to free her, but had requested a bribe of 600 guilders. Jan did not have the money, and he asked the Ten Bombs for a loan. The following day at 5 a.m., the Ten Bombs were holding a Bible reading with many family members and friends from the community attending, alongside six refugees. The doorbell rang. When Betsy opened the door, she was pushed aside by a Nazi officer. Other soldiers burst in, led by Vogel. He was a collaborator. Betsy was able to hit one of the buzzers and the six refugees, four Jews and two resistance fighters, ran to Corrie's bedroom. While the soldiers were negotiating the strange layout of the house, making their way upwards, Corrie was able to hide the refugees behind the fake wall. She later commented that the uncommon floor plans of the house were another sign of God's providence which had come to help her in a predicament. The Nazis accused her of hiding Jews, hitting her repeatedly, but she kept her mouth shut. The soldiers, they searched the house, and they couldn't find the secret room. One of them was heard saying, If there is a secret room here, the devil himself built it. Cory, Betsy, and Casper were arrested alongside 30 other friends and taken to Schaffeninger Prison. As Corrie was ill with pleurisy, she was put in solitary confinement to prevent a contagion. One day, in her lonely cell, Corrie received a letter from her sister Nolly, who was still free. The letter bore the sad news that Casper, her elderly father, had died ten days into his imprisonment. Corrie had not seen him since the day they arrived in prison. It was devastating for Corrie to learn that her father, who had been the moral guiding light to her and so many other people in Harlem, was no more. Despite the grief, there was some good news, though. Corrie noticed that the address on the envelope slanted towards the stamp. Curious, she unpeeled it and found a secret message. It read, 
all the watchers are safe a code phrase meaning that all of their Jewish guests were out of hiding and still alive. Corrie had little time to grieve as she was summoned for interrogation. The first hearing was with a German officer, a Lieutenant Rams. The officer was polite, albeit dismissive of Corrie's activism in supporting and protecting the mentally disabled seen as undesirables by the Reich. Caring for them was a waste of energy, as one normal person is worth all the halfwits in the world. To which Corrie replied, In God's eyes, one halfwit might be worth more than a watchmaker or a lieutenant. The next interrogator was a Dutch judge collaborating with the German authorities. In Corrie's own words, her faith touched him and he became a friend. But this friend still had to do his job. The judge produced some documents found at her house, a list of names and addresses, which would immediately incriminate her remaining family members and resistance friends who were still at large. The judge remarked how dangerous those papers were to the safety of the organization that she had set up. Then, without adding a word, he simply turned to his stove, opened up the door, and threw them into the flames. After three months, Corrie was finally taken out of confinement and reunited with her beloved sister Betsy. There was no hope to be set free, though, as they and all other prisoners were loaded onto cattle trains and sent to the Dutch labor camp of Vught, where they were forced to make radios for the Luftwaffe. Then the 6th of June 1944 arrived. D-Day. As the Allies pushed their way towards Flanders, the Nazis decided to empty their camps in the Netherlands and relocate the prisoners to Germany. Corrie and Betsy ended up in Ravensbrück, the infamous camp for women prisoners. The experience in the concentration camp was hellish. Corrie, Betsy, and the other prisoners were subjected to endless days of labor, starvation, illness, and abuse by the guards. And yet, every night, the two sisters would find the time and energy to organize prayer groups in their barracks with the help of a smuggled Bible. Every night, this would give the incarcerated women some peace, some faith, and hope. And every night, Corrie and Betsy, they feared an inspection from the guards, well knowing that Bibles and prayer were forbidden in the camp. But in another stroke of luck, or maybe divine intervention, word had spread that their barracks was flea-infested, and so the wardens they kept a safe distance. In the late autumn, Betsy fell ill. During this time, she discussed with Corrie a vision that she had, a plan to heal the wounds of the suffering in post-war Europe. First, they were going to set up a sort of rehabilitation center in the Netherlands to provide support for those who had suffered during the war. And the center also had to be open to Nazi collaborators so as to reform them and reintegrate them into society. Then Corrie and Betsy would proceed to help the German people as well, as it was clear that their country was going to be devastated. Betsy even had a mental image of a former concentration camp painted in green and converted into a welcome center. Betsy, though, she wouldn't live to see her vision. She died on the 16th of December 1944. Now alone and losing hope, on the morning of the 28th of December, Corrie was summoned to the commander's office and asked to fill in some forms and was simply released. She later discovered that this was due to a clerical error and that only a week later, all of the women her age had been taken to the gas chambers. The war had taken a huge toll on the Ten Bombs. Casper, Betsy, and brother Willem were dead. Willem's son, Kik, was missing in action. Corrie, though, she would not surrender. She immediately resumed her work with mentally disabled children, but most of all, she carried out Betsy's vision, her plan for reconciliation. As she was setting up her home to rehabilitate former collaborators, she received a letter from the man who had betrayed her and her family, Jan Vogel. Awaiting a death sentence, Jan had written to Corrie, asking if she could forgive him. She could. And she did. This was the first of many acts of forgiveness for her old enemies and tormentors. Continuing Betsy's vision, Corrie moved to Germany and succeeded in gaining management of an ex-concentration camp in Darmstadt. As per her sister's wishes, she had all of the buildings painted bright green and flowers planted around the houses. The old site of death became a housing center for German families that were left homeless by the Allied bombing raids. Corrie also started to tour churches from the Netherlands to Germany, giving talks about her experiences in Ravensbrück. On one such occasion, she noticed a man sitting at the back of the room who would not meet her gaze. She then recognized him. He was a former guard at the concentration camp, one who had been particularly cruel to her sister. He had become a Christian and was now looking for forgiveness. He stretched out his hand. Corrie initially could not accept it. The memories of the man's cruelties were still strong. But she remembered from the Bible that hatred means murder in God's eyes. She was able to forgive the former guard. This act would inspire her to continue her tours, relating her experience and preaching the power of forgiveness of your enemies. 
This was a powerful and courageous idea. One cannot deny that the Nuremberg trials were what Nazi war criminals deserved, and yet the idea of private forgiveness can coexist with the notion of public justice. As philosopher Paul Ricoeur put it, forgiveness is not amnesty. Amnesty is organized forgetting, and it has nothing to do with the pacification that forgiveness can bring between two consciousnesses. In the 1960s, Corrie moved to the United States to spread her messages across congregations of all faiths. She was penniless and lived frugally. All the publicity she could afford was to go from one church to another and ask if the community was interested in hearing her story. Little by little, people started to take notice of this elderly lady, her erasure style, and her values. Her admirers suggested that she write a book about her experience. The Hiding Place was published in 1971, followed by a film adaptation in 1975. Corrie continued to receive more and more invitations to speak worldwide, but she had to slow down her engagements due to declining health. One morning in 1978, Corrie did not wake up at dawn as usual. Her assistant and friend, Pam Rosewell Moore, went to wake her up, as it was uncommon for Corrie to oversleep in the mornings. Pam found out that during the night, Corrie had had a cerebral vascular stroke from which she did not recover. For the following five years, she was paralyzed, unable to talk, read, and write. Finally, on the day of her 91st birthday, the 15th of April 1981, Corrie Ten Boom died peacefully. According to Jewish tradition, only those who are specially blessed by God are granted the privilege of dying on the same day as their birthday. So I really hope you found that video interesting. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please do use the comments below for that. Also, please don't forget to subscribe and like this video and all of that good stuff. And as always, I'll see you next time.